Jim Sexton is a divorce lawyer in high conflict cases. He wrote the book How to Stay in Love based on his nearly three decades of inside access to the explosive end of relationships. We chat about why people grow to hate the ones they love, why marriage is a broken technology, how to craft the perfect prenup to avoid financial ruin, and the most important rule for not having your relationship end in a divorce. I read your book and I thought it was so interesting that Thanks. you did it. One, that you knew that you wanted to be a divorce lawyer early in law school, which you say almost no one does. Yeah. And two, that you did hospice care uh, early yeah. on in your career. And I'm wondering if you see a thread there, because I did, of something about endings drawing you and, and almost like a willingness to unflinchingly look at how yeah. things can fall apart. Yeah, yeah. It's really amazing that you see that thread. And I, I really like that. Um, and I think it's a very real one. Mm -hmm. I, I won't say when it was happening, it was a conscious one, but I think as I've aged, I now see that more clearly. I, I see what it was. I think I've come to the realization, and I came to it many years ago, but it's been driven home to me ever since over and over again, that to love anything is a form of insanity. Because mm -hmm. to love anything is to is to accept that you will lose it. Like there's nothing you can love that you won't lose. Like I, I'm a dog person. You know, I have pictures of my dogs in the office, mm -hmm. not my kids. Um, <laughs> and if you learn anything from dogs, it's that they're just this unbelievably pure love and you lose them so fast. Like 10 yeah. years, 15 years just flies by. And so to love them, to let them into your heart, you're just accepting from the minute you agree to love them or let yourself love them that you're just going to get gutted by them. Like that you're, they're just going to kill you in some ways. But yet Jeez. you want, you should love them anyway. Like like the beauty, you know, I, I was very interested in, um, when I did hospice work, I used to read a lot of uh, work by Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the Buddhist mm -hmm. uh, monk and, and Nobel Prize, um, uh, Peace Prize uh, nominee. And he passed some years ago now, but his, some of his writing was so beautiful. One of the things he used to say is that when you hug someone, you should think about the fact that they're there and you're hugging them. And then you should close your eyes and imagine that they're dead mm. and that you're hugging their, their dead body for the last time before they take it away. And then you should think about the fact that they're there and alive and you're hugging them. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking if you did that, you would never take anything for granted. Like you would just, you would remember to just keep that in very like Epictetus or any of the Stoic philosophers, you know, the idea of keeping death present, this memento mori, this idea that everything is so finite, really is, is the lens through which we should view these things. And, and you know, when my, when my dog is sitting there sort of staring at me with his dog breath, breathing at me and looking at me, <laughs> and I remember he will not always be here. And so the smell of him and the feeling of him is temporary. And mm -hmm. that I just, I, I want to remember it, you know? And and I feel like that was driven home to me from a very young age for a variety of reasons. My mother who passed away eight years ago, from the time I was very little, fought a long and difficult battle with cancer. So it was always in my vision that my mom was going to die. And mm -hmm. I had been told she was gonna die in six months, five or 10 times throughout my life. So from a very young age, this sort of, well, the things you love will be lost was always there. And, and, and I think you can either fold up on that or you can see that as an invitation to just be very brave in the way that you love and to be very mindful of loss. And uh, the hospice work, yeah, it was weird. I mean, I look at it now, I was 21, 22 years old and, you know, you graduate college and you know, you really probably should like have fun and go out with your friends and, and get drunk. <laughs> and instead I was volunteering and doing hospice work. And I was, wow. um, it was the end, sort of the tail end of the AIDS crisis before uh, the antibiotic cocktails became a thing. And so they would put me, cause I was the only hospice volunteer who was like under 60 or 70. And so they would put me with all of these late stage AIDS patients who had things like progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is like essentially like mad cow disease, but in humans and, and they mm -hmm. would lose the ability to speak. And so I would just sit there with them and talk to them wow. or read to them. And it, I just, I have to tell you, I used to walk out of 
these nursing homes where these young people were dying or these houses. And I would just feel so alive. I would just feel so grateful that like, that I was getting in my marvelous car and I was going to drive home and eat a meal and I could talk and I could see and I could hear. And I just felt so lucky all the time. And, and so, yeah, I think in, if we're conscious all the time of how things end, I think we're much more present in what's happening. I, I try to tell everyone I love at the end of every conversation I have, I try to say, I love you and, and let them say, I love you. And I have to tell you, I've been doing that for so many years. And now I've reached the point in life where there are three or four friends that have passed away unexpectedly. And I know the last thing I said to them was, I love Aww. you. And I know the last thing they said to me was, I love you. And that that is the greatest comfort in the world to have that with someone, to know wow. that the last thing you said to them was, I love you. So, That's so beautiful. That is, uh, I, I feel well enough. It's very here. real. It's very yeah. real, man. You got you to practice it. That's something yeah. you have to practice in your life. Like the people you love need to know you love them. They need to know that you know they love you. Like yeah. that's another huge thing. I always tell my sons, I'm always like, you need to know, I know you love me. Yeah. Like hear, hear that, hear that I know you love me. So if I die tomorrow, just know I knew how much you love me. You don't ever have to worry, did he know? Because yeah. I do. That is a big worry, as I realized when people, did they, did I communicate what I needed to yeah. communicate to them so that they felt it in a way? Because you, yes. you don't get that chance again. Wow. Yeah, that's a, right. that's a very important Because one. it's not a question that we ask, right? Like, mm -hmm. we don't ask, hey, do you know I love you? Like, do you know how much, like, do you know how mm -hmm. much joy you give me? Do you know how glad I am that I have you in my life, that you were part of this walk with me? And I feel like if, if, if we just had that conversation, like someday that will be a conversation we'll remember or they'll remember. One of the two wow. of us is going to die first. Like you or I, one of us is going to die first. It's unlikely we're going to die at the exact same time, you and I. So mm -hmm. the question becomes like, what will what will you remember? You know, like what will you remember of that? I, I, I remember watching an interview with Brandon Lee, Bruce Lee's son, who died during the filming of the movie The Crow. And the movie The Crow, you know, is really about death and life and all of those things. And of course, he ended up dying on the set of the film in an accident. But in the interview that they were doing while the thing was being filmed, he said, and I, it stuck with me, he said, you know, there's a finite number of sunsets I'm going to see. Mm -hmm. He's like, I don't know that number now, but there is. Like, there will be a time where I'll be able to go, okay, that was the last one. And I just feel like if if we could communicate in a way that honors that, that like this might be the last thing you do. You know, this might be the last conversation you have with this person. Every time you talk to anyone, this might be the last time you talk to that person. I just think we would view things very, very differently. Yeah. Well, and, and in reading your book, it occurs to me, you talk about how people lie to themselves that like Western marriage is almost a complete denial of that. It's now we're right. in it forever and always and always. Let's not even think or consider that this could end. And you make the point that you just made that this is ending. It's either ending in divorce or death definitely. for one of us. This is yes. this is definitely yes. ending. And people, they see uh, implicitly marriage as it's over now into eternity, which is just not the case. Right. right. And And there's also something, it feels profane to me that like, I now owe you my love and you owe me your love. Like there's this, mm -hmm. this sense that I, I get with a certain approach to marriage, which has become and was for a long time the most popular view. Like the wife who rolls her eyes about the husband and what yeah, an idiot yeah. he is. And the man who's like, oh, this loathsome harpy who's not sleeping with me anymore. <laughs> and all I could think was like, wait, you're, you're free. Like, you don't have to be married. No one made you get married. I don't care that your aunt wanted you to get married. You didn't have to get married. There were 7.3 billion people in the world, and you chose this one and said, I want to hold hands and walk through this with you, whether it's going to be wonderful or it's going to be a horror show. Like, I'm choosing you. Like, why, why would you stay in a mm. situation that you don't feel loved and supported or that it's bringing out the best in you and you're bringing out the best in them. Like, I think that that if we could be 
this idea of like, let's never talk about this relationship ever ending. Let's never talk about what we owe or don't owe to each other. Let's never talk about what we expect from each other. Let's just pretend everything's fine and just keep going. Like, I just think it's a it's a guarantee of driving into a brick wall. And the statistics mm -hmm. back that up. Like marriage is an unbelievably unsuccessful technology. <laughs> it's a bad bet under its current format. That doesn't mean it's not a worthy pursuit. It just means we got to try it differently. We got to look yeah. at it differently. We got to approach it differently. What are those different approaches? Because I mean, selfishly, the question that I have for you is, what do I need to know? Should I get married? To whom should I get married? Is this person, you know, and I want to just yeah. play that role for the audience here. Yeah. So like, yeah, what I think you have to ask yourself the question, what is the problem to which marriage is a solution? Mm -hmm. Because everything you do, is a solution, right, to some problem. Like you have headphones, it's a solution to a problem. You don't want ambient yeah. noise interrupting your ability to hear what's going on. Okay, mm -hmm. like the, that chair is a solution to a problem. And that problem mm -hmm. is the problem of, you know, if you sit on the floor, you're not elevated enough, it's not comfortable. Okay, what is the problem to which marriage is a solution? Because if you ask most people that question, they're, they're, they're creating imaginary solutions to real problems and, and real solutions to imaginary problems. Like you can't say marriage solves the problem of not being married. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> That's just a circular stupidity. So the problem of loneliness, you know, try again. It doesn't solve yeah. that problem. Any more than your headphones solves the problem of your ear being itchy or, or, or <laughs> your desk being too short. Makes like it, it worse. Doesn't, <laughs> right, like, like, right. And by the way, marriage can make loneliness worse. Yeah. There's nothing more lonely than being with someone and feeling alone. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. At least when I'm by myself and I feel by myself, it's honest. Mm -hmm. But I'm sitting next to someone and I don't feel seen and I don't feel important and I feel alone. It's like why New York City has a, 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 a despair in it that's very hard for other cities to uh. match because you're just surrounded by people and completely alone and no yeah. one's talking to each other and no one's interacting with each other and people could literally just die and people just keep walking and step over them. Yeah. And, and that's what makes it so existentially terrifying sometimes is that you're like, wait, I'm I'm surrounded by people and I'm completely by myself. Whereas in a small town where there's fewer people, people might look out for me and kind of inquire about me. So I think mm. ask yourself, what is the problem to which marriage is a solution? And unless you can identify something, you know, there's a there's a lot to be gleaned just in that asking that question. Cause it's like, yeah. it's not the problem of I'm not getting sex. I mean, look, there was a time where that was like, you want to buy the ticket, you got to take the ride, right? So you want to have sex with somebody, you got to marry him. You want to have sex with a man wants to have sex with a woman, he's got to marry her, you got to put a ring on it. Okay, that's gone now, that's over. Like you don't, I don't know if I'm breaking that news to anybody, but yeah, you do not have to be married to have sex. Um, so the truth is, why are we doing it? Again, loneliness yeah. doesn't solve that problem necessarily. This person wants to get married. Okay, people want things all the time that I don't owe them, you know? So what? what is the problem to which marriage is a solution? And that's a question that I, I do not think that people even ask themselves. Because that's how, if you said to me, should I get married? I have to push back with that question, which is, well, what yeah. is the problem marriage would solve for you? What is the any. need? <laughs> huh? It's funny because I've, I've had a girlfriend for five years and I can't imagine what, I don't need marriage to solve personally any problem. Now right. she might feel differently about that. Sure, marriage might solve sure. a problem of anxiety or something like that. Or, Well, wait a minute. But when I think about what, again, her, I'd be as interested to know her answer if I was mm -hmm. you. I'd be mm -hmm. actually way more interested if I was you. Because when yeah. she says, I want to get married, what is she saying? Because I don't think she's saying, I really want the government to get involved in this relationship. <laughs> I think what she's saying is, I want to feel like I am the most special person yes. to you. Yes. Okay, that makes sense to me. Like that makes sense mm -hmm. to me. I don't know that marriage is the way to do that. I'm, I'm not yeah. saying it's not. I'm not saying it's not. If you say to me, this is my girlfriend, or you say to me, this is my wife, I view those two things differently. Absolutely, we mm -hmm. all do, we all do. Like, And by the way, why? You've been with your girlfriend five years, somebody mm -hmm. could be with a girl for 24 hours and marry her. You're telling yeah. me he's got a deeper relationship 
because Elvis married them on a whim while they were drunk in Vegas? Like, no, yeah. you spent five years with someone, you've been through some stuff with them. So get to the core. I think if you say to your girlfriend, look, what is it, why do you want to get married? You want to put on a, a dress and you want to have a party where we're the center of attention and celebrate do our that. love? <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my, let me tell you something, man. The first time everybody you love gets in a room together should not be your funeral. Okay. Like, I think it's wonderful. I love a wedding. I love mm. a wedding, not just because it's good for business. I love a wedding because I just love the, like, hey, you, you know, we're all here together celebrating these two people. Like, I believe, I, I don't believe for a second that everything I need to know about myself, I can learn from myself. I, mm. I think I need someone to see my blind spots. And I think totally. the definition of intimacy is, is the ability to be yourself with someone else, completely yourself with someone else. And when someone sees who you really are and they love you and they're cheering for you and they're like, I want to be with you and support you and I want your support to be the best version of me I can be and I want to help you be the best version. Oh my God, what is there in the world more worthy of celebration than that? Mm -hmm. But does that mean the government's got to get involved? Does that mean that you got to sign some legal documents that opt you out of the title system? Does that mean that? No, it doesn't. That's insane. That's insane. You're actually taking away from a couple a lot of the power and agency and autonomy that they have and letting other people make decisions about fundamental important things in their relationship and creating expectations in their relationship that are imposed on them. Like someone, someone said to me some years ago that um, tradition is peer pressure exerted by dead people. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really think that's true. I'm not saying yeah. traditions don't have value, but tradition is peer pressure exerted by dead people. And mm. you're getting married. Why? Because my mom got married. My dad got married. Why? Because their mom and dad got married. Okay. Your mom and dad didn't use Uber. Does that mean we shouldn't use Uber? Like, does mm. that mean we shouldn't? Like, your mom and dad didn't have cell phones. Should we not have cell phones? Like, I think it's good to say stick with the traditions and the concepts that work and let's modify and tweak the other ones to reflect our real circumstances. Yeah. So, and I think I, I tend to agree with you. I also am wary of, I don't know if you know Chesterton's fence, the idea that if you come across a fence in the middle of a field, the idea that you can just kick it over without any exploration is right. probably a bad idea. Right. So what are the pieces of marriage that should get pulled through? Because it does seem to me that some sort of public declaration of an intention sure. is very valuable. That sure. uh, even just the ornament of a ring, which which signals yeah. to others, Symbol. like stop, don't hit on me. <laughs> you know, Do you, this is not it doesn't in practice have that effect. As a man who was married, I can tell you that it, it kind of has the opposite effect. It demonstrates to the world that there's at least one other person who can stand you. And and it it it, it may not always send that message, you know. Is you know, I, I'm I'm 35 now and I worked so hard in my 20s to uh, get the attention of women. And it it, sure. does, it has gotten easier as I've entered my 30s. I'm wondering if that trend in continues as, as yeah. you get older. Uh, you know, I said to my own sons from from once they reached, you know, the teenage years or even the college years, I, I, I said to them, look, you're going to lose a lot more money chasing women than you'll lose women chasing money. Mm -hmm. And and the nicer way of saying that is to say that if you try to catch a butterfly, you won't catch it. But if you mm -hmm. tend to your garden, the butterflies come. Yeah. And so I think tending your garden is really important. I think you you've created, you know, through your efforts, through your creativity, through your agency, you've created, um, you know, a life that is filled with interesting conversation, interesting experiences, professional success, fulfillment, you know. Um, you, you, you can't build a business and you can't build, you know, a platform without having discipline, you know, which is the ability to trade what you want now for what you want most. And so I genuinely believe that, you know, that's very appealing, right? To any human being, w women in particular, if you're, if they're looking to have a family someday, I mean, look again, fundamentally, it comes down to the unit of the family, you know, do, do we want to have children someday? And if we're mm -hmm. going to have children, do we want to create a stable environment for them? Again, these are all very pleasant, ideally side effects of a marriage, right? I, I don't think they're created by marriage. I, I mm -hmm. understand that there are plenty of religious texts in a variety of religions that suggest that you have to get married to have children and that God was, you know, making people get married and that it's a sacrament. I, I, I'm not qualified to argue whether God exists or wants things from us. I, I, I don't know that anybody is. I'm, I'm sort of just an agnostic atheist in that sense. But I do believe that I, the tangible reality 
is, yeah, it, it's great when children have people who love them, mm -hmm. when the people who they are related to, their two parents, love them and nurture them and create environments where they're the best of themselves and they bring that to their raising of their children. No one can argue that those are anything but positive things. Yeah. But does marriage create that? I don't I don't know that it does. I, I, I actually have seen plenty of marriages where it's quite antagonistic to that message, where people who were probably would have been better parents if they were divorced parents and coming to the fullness of themselves. So I, I think that fundamentally, if the question is what parts of marriage are worth keeping and what parts of marriage need to kind of go off to die, I think that's a very personal question. And it has okay. to do with the two people in the relationship. I, and I think mm -hmm. I have seen ethically non-monogamous relationships, um, but not many. I've mostly seen that that monogamy works for people as, as the best kind of romantic pair bond. But the question is, is how can you be satisfied and monogamous? I don't think most people, you know, the goal of marriage should not be to stay married. Like, yeah, it sucked, but man, we held through. Like, we did it, you know? like that, <laughs> Grit our <that's>, teeth. <laughs> that seems terrible to me. Like, or, or we managed to not sleep with anybody else. God, we wanted to, and we haven't had fulfilling yeah. sex lives for a decade, but man, we didn't marry, we didn't sleep with anybody else. Like, well, that seems like a really stupid way to live your life. Like that seems yeah. like you're gonna really regret that someday. You know, all the sex you didn't have, you know, and all the fulfillment and joy you didn't have. Um, I'm not suggesting that sex necessarily leads to joy. Sex can lead to lots of pain and lots of upset. But I think that it really comes down to having an honest conversation with yourself about what you want at different chapters of your life. I mean, the other thing is too, you're 35. You know, what you wanted when you were 25, like the example I always give people is, Marriage, theoretically, is picking one car that you're going to drive for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you were 25, if I said you can drive any car, you're going to go Ferrari. You're going to go, you know, I want Lamborghini. 35, you might go, you know, it's kind of impractical. And like, I, I like to drive in the city. It's going to get whacked up. I can't park it on the street. Maybe I'll get like a nice Mercedes or I'll get a nice, you know, Tesla, you know, Plaid or something. <laughs> okay, now you're 40 something. All right, maybe you want something a little more family friendly. Now you're 50 something. Well, I don't really want to get in that, you know, like, but if you're buying one car and that's the car you got to have for the rest of your life, you got to find a car that's going to suit you in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s. Like marriage was invented when people died at 40, yeah. you know, and, and women died in childbirth primarily. So now we're talking about a long lifespan. And how do you do that? Well, you do it, I think, by constantly making adjustments, like having mm -hmm. a car that you're willing to sort of rebuild, yeah. you know, and change the pieces of. And the way to do that is two people having an honest conversation about that. And I think the government telling you how things should be done, whether you like it or not, is probably not a good step in that process. It takes it out of your hands and puts it in some stranger's hands, the government's hands of all places, which is like, mm -hmm. you want to make anything get screwed up, hand it to the government. The you made the point repeatedly in the book about honesty, you know, these honest conversations that need to happen. You talked one that is stood out to me that I think I'm only starting to see the importance of because in your 20s, you're not with anyone long enough to get to the point where you're like, I know you so well. But sex talking about that yeah. and what it means and the fact that you would need to converse about it when if you told me that at 25, I'd be like, that's for deadbeat losers who don't you know what I mean? Yeah. But at, the, at 25, it's I'm in short term yeah. relationships. It's sure. all chemistry. It's all fling. And now yeah. that I'm approaching six years in, it's like we, we need to talk about how to uh, not just be so intimately comfortable with one right. another right. that we maintain excitement, right. spark, s something. A hundred percent. And you know what? One of the things I, I talk about, you'll recall in the book, is that that um, I think with really good intentions, people ruin their sex life. Mm -hmm. Because I think when you, when you meet your part, when you have those short-term relationships in your 20s, let's say, you're just throwing all your greatest hits, man. You're just like, you know, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. And you're so into the person because there's they're new that like everything's yeah. kind of cool. You're like, all right, well, that's fun. Like, oh, somebody did that before and I loved it. No, no one's ever done that before. And you you're into it. Okay. So now you get into a relationship for all the reasons that people want to stay in a relationship. You like this person, there's connections outside the bedroom as well as in the bedroom. But look, 
You want to keep connections in the bedroom. Like, this is why it's not a roommate or a friend. It's a person. It's a romantic connection. You want sex is at the core of that. Sex is the Mm -hmm. glue. Like, that's a really. Okay, so now what do you do? You're throwing greatest hits at each other for that first (laughs) months of the relationship. And then you start to figure out, okay, she likes this. This she really likes, you know. Mm -hmm. This she's not so into. Okay, cool. The, The last one liked that, but okay, everybody's different. You know, this one likes that. And she's doing the same math, man. Unless you've met a virgin who's never been with anybody. She's doing the same math. Like, okay, let me try this. Oh, he likes that. Oh, he really likes that. Okay. Well, he doesn't like that so much. That's weird because the other one liked that. Okay, cool. Not everybody's built the same. Everyone's got different equipment. And and so what do you start to do? Like you start to just play the hits, right? Mm -hmm. You figure out what is your partner like and you play the hits. And you know what? That's great. When I go see Bruce Springsteen... I didn't go to see the ghost of Tom Joad. I came to see Born to Run, Thunder Road, Born in the USA. Like, play the hits, man. You know, you want to throw a couple acoustics, go ahead. But mainly play the hits. So that's what you do. Well, now what happens? You've been playing the hits with good intentions. You want your partner to feel loved and sexy and have fun and enjoy the stuff she enjoys the most and that you enjoy most. Well, now you're in a routine. You're Mm -hmm. in a routine. You're doing the same damn thing over and over. And now... If you do something different, like you've been with your girl for five years, you do some completely different thing in some completely different order in bed, and it is going to be like the screeching record you're going to hear. It's like the, whoa, whoa, what was that? Where did that come from? Like, so then what's the choice? Well, we talk about it in advance. We're like, darling, this evening I was thinking I might pinch your nipple. You know, like, wait, oh, oh, okay. Like, that's weird that we're having that discussion. So I, what I try to talk about in the book are some ways... To, to, to break through monotony and routine and, and, and not have it be weird, right? Like not, mm-hmm. not calling an audible in the middle of the bedroom that freaks somebody out or makes them think like, hey, are you cheating or something that you're trying this different thing? And I, I said one of the easiest ways to do it without question is the I had a dream last night. <laughs> Everybody loves that. Oh, I, had a dream. I had the craziest dream about you last night. You want your girl's attention, man? Say to her, babe, I had whew, I had a dream about you last night. Why did you dream about it? It was what it was. I don't know where I would it was. Maybe I shouldn't have dairy before bed. I don't know what happened. It was crazy. You were it was you, but like you were doing some stuff. What was I doing? Da-da-da. And if you tell it. It starts a dialogue about, well, I, I would do that, which mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, we never have, but I don't know. Something in my subconscious was like, let's give that a shot, you know? Mm-hmm. And then it's a joke. It becomes something fun where it's like, hey, want to make each other's dreams come true? You know, like you can you can find ways to like, because again, I, I say in the book, if there's something you want in bed, whether it was something you didn't realize about yourself or whether it's something that you saw either in you know porn or you heard about or you read about or just something that occurs to you a fantasy a dream something you know if you want it but you don't want to have that weird awkwardness with your partner or talk about it with your partner well you're either going to go without or go elsewhere those are your two mm-hmm. choices you're either not going to get that need fulfilled or that curiosity you know satisfied or you're just going to go elsewhere you're going to try it with somebody else and and I think most people don't really want that. They want their primary relationship to be satisfying. Like they yeah. happy people don't cheat. Sexually satisfied people don't cheat. You know, you you don't finish having satisfying sex and go, man, I gotta go get laid. Like you you finish having satisfying sex and you're like, man, that was really good. You know, that was really fun. I'm really that was great. I'm looking forward to doing that again. You know, Is, and so. It- is that your professional experience? I'm genuine because I've heard that and you're someone who would know having, you know, yeah. talked to people. Do do people come in and be like, no, we're having amazing sex, but our relationship? No. Like how often that's that just no. doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. I have to wow. tell you, I've been I've been a divorce lawyer 23 years. People have said everything to me. I mean, people mm. have come in and said he's sleeping with my sister or I'm sleeping with her sister yeah. or, you know, I, I mean, I've had I've had every variety of everything. And, mm. and I, I have never had, it's rare that I say never, I have never wow. had someone say sex was fire and continued to be fire, but it's just not working out. Never, never happened. That's, I've never, it's never happened. That is an incredible bellwether then. I mean, and something to pay attention to, whether it's- How could it not be? <laughs> sex sells everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. come on, man. Like, you, what do you think? Why, why, how do we sell beer? Sex. Mm-hmm. How do we sell cars? Sex. Everything is sex. Like, what's the, what's the main thing people are doing on the internet? Porn. Like, that's it. Like, people mm-hmm. are 
fascinated by sex, riveted by sex. Wars are fought over sex. I mean, I'm constantly joking about the fact that, you know, if you believe in the Bible and you believe in the Ten Commandments, God got to give you ten rules. And two of them had to do with having sex. <laughs> you know, thou shalt not kill one time. Don't bear false witness one time. You know, <laughs> keep holy the Sabbath one time. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. That's two. <laughs> two out of ten. That's yeah. crazy. Fully one fifth <laughs> of the Ten Commandments are about having sex. Why? Because mm -hmm. this has been something that's going on forever. So why is it shocking that sex is incredibly important in relationships? But it's incredibly fraught because it's tied in with power and agency and roles and expectations and what do we owe each other. And it's tied in with gender stuff and it's tied in with, you know, uh, a, a, an economy of sorts, right? Like mm -hmm. sex is an economy, you know, love is an economy, you know, based on the frailty of human beings. It's an economy. It's a, I'm, I'm giving and receiving, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, we don't like having honest conversations about it, but I yeah. think we should. I think that the the sooner we do, the better we'll get at this. I genuinely believe that. Going to practical, uh, yours, mine, ours as a way mm -hmm. of setting up a uh, thing. I love it. It makes sense. I don't know why it's not a more boilerplate default conversation that people have, but can you talk about yeah. concretely what a yours, mine, ours prenup type agreement is? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I think you're totally right. It's silly that you got to even put that in a prenup. Like that should mm -hmm. be the way it is. I mean, I don't know why the law is, I understand why the law is different than that. And I guess I'm thankful for it because I've made a very good living as a result of it, but it really just seems like, man, it just should be so much simpler. The, the idea I, I've always advocated for, whether someone is a millionaire or a millionaire to be, or whether they just have very little, but they want to keep their life simple in the event that they are in the majority and their relationship or marriage ends. Um, I'm a fan of a prenup that just, I call the yours, mine, and ours, which is if it's in your name, it's yours. If it's in my name, it's mine. And if it's in our joint names, we split it 50-50. And that mm -hmm. in and of itself would make divorce law a much less lucrative you know, uh, endeavor for people and divorce a lot less expensive of a thing. Because what happens when you get married, and no one tells you this when you're getting married, and no one even tells you this while you are married, usually the first time people hear it is when they're sitting across the desk from me and they're being told it for the first time when it's already too late to do anything about it, is that you opt out of the title system. So if you buy your spouse a watch, you bought yourself one half of that watch. If you buy <laughs> You know, her uh, 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 a tennis bracelet, you bought yourself one half of a tennis bracelet. Um, mm -hmm. If you incur 10,000 in credit card debt, she's on the hook for five. And that is not something people really know. So yeah. I'm a fan of, of, again, agency, autonomy, and conversation. And I think it's really important for people to talk about their their finances. If you can't have hard conversations, you you really shouldn't be in a long-term relationship with someone, a cohabitation with someone. I think it's important to be able to talk about, okay, I got this check. Do we put it in my account? Do we put it in our joint account? Mm -hmm. You know, if we split up, what do we owe each other? What do you need? What would you need? You know, what would I need? What could I afford to give you? What could you afford to take? What are you giving up in this relationship financially? And what are yeah. you gaining in this relationship financially? And, and, and I think that allowing the government to make that decision doesn't make sense to me. Again, I've been mm -hmm. to the DMV. If you've been to the DMV, you know that these people should not be in charge of things. Like it's not an, this is not a place where you walk in and go, you know, this is where efficiency and logic absolutely <laughs> rule the day. You walk in and go, okay, this is bureaucracy, insanity, boredom, chaos, and disorganization of the worst kind. So why would we let that govern our primary relationships when we could just as easily say, let's have a rule book and then let's have conversations along the mm -hmm. way of as money comes in, as money goes out, as our financial situations change, as we both grow as professionals or one grows and the other stagnates. What do we owe each other? How will we take care of each other and ourselves? What are we responsible for? I think those are big, important conversations. And I, I mm -hmm. can't think of, I like games that have simple rules. You know, mm -hmm. if I have to read a 50 page rule book, I don't want to play the game. It doesn't seem as much fun. So yeah. I, I think simple rules are better because, but again, the reason people avoid it is, oh my God, then we have to like talk about it. 
You know, then we're going to have to talk about like when money comes in, what are we going to do with it? Okay. Constantly, yeah. Good, yeah. good. Talk about it. If you can't talk to this person, don't marry them. That's a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea to marry someone you can't talk to. It's terrible, stupid. Yeah. There's no sex that good. There's no sex so good that you should marry a person you can't talk to. It's not it's not possible. So concretely on this one, does that sound like you get a prenup that says, look, if it's in your name, it's yours, mine. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's consistent conversations, which is, OK, we're going to get this car. I'm going to take it out in my name. I'm going to pay from my account. And in the event mm -hmm. of a split, that's my car. And there's no there's not right. even a. OK. And that's so that's it. what it looks like. Just that simple. Or it could yeah. be some other arrangement. The loan's going to be in both of our names because both of us are going to use it. But I and put then, the down payment down. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have it titled in my name. So okay. I'm going to be the one who keeps it. But you're getting to use it like you talk about what it's going to be. Or so you're you opting say, back into the title system, essentially with a prenup. Exactly you're saying, right. Okay. You're opting back into the title system. And what you're doing also, I think, is having conversations about mm -hmm. what trade offs we're making. Got because it. then if you're if you do it right, you're going to have the next conversation, which is, OK, so the car's in your name mm -hmm. and you're going to make the payments. But I can use the car and that's mm -hmm. nice. Um, but if we break up, I don't have a car. Mm -hmm. So what would we do then? And you mm -hmm. go, well, that makes sense because, you know, you're not going to want to walk everywhere, but I'm not going to, you know, we've agreed you're not going to take the car. Mm -hmm. So what if when we break up, um, I would give you $1,500 so that you'd have the down payment and the first lease payment on a vehicle? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Or, okay, you know, what we would do is if we break up um, and the car has the loan is paid off on the car by that time, then I'll pay you a sum equivalent to the one half of all the payments we made during the marriage towards the car. You can just have conversations about what would we owe each other. Again, if I said to you, and, and I, please, I apologize because I know you're a dog lover and I'm a dog lover <laughs> and I see your adorable dog sitting on the in the couch oh, in yeah. the background. <laughs> if I said to you, and this is not gonna happen, don't worry. If I said to you, today's the last day you're gonna have that dog. Mm. What would you do with your day? I guarantee it would involve that dog. I guarantee yeah, yeah. you would love that dog differently. You'd spend time with that dog differently. You'd snuggle it differently. Okay, so so it's not, thank God, thinking about that is not gonna make your dog die. It's not gonna make your dog run away. Thinking about it is just going to make you, yes, a little anxious probably, but also it's gonna make you mindful of, of how much you love that dog how much value that dog brings to your life, how much poorer you would be in the absence of that dog, and how you should, how much joy you give it and it gives you and you're going to want to embrace it. Why is talking about the end of a relationship, even in the context of a car, like I see that as an opportunity. Like I'm, we're getting mm -hmm. a car. This is an opportunity to talk about how much we love each other mm -hmm. and what would we do without each other. And yeah. what do we need from each other? And what do we do for each other gladly? Because yeah, we love each other. Even on a practical level, it's like, oh, this relationship guarantees me access to a car that isn't mine. It's just this, it's it's just that recognition. And by the way, <laughs> isn't that lovely? Isn't yeah, that yeah. lovely? Like yeah. if, you, if you go, you mean I get to be with this beautiful woman and I get a car? That's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. You know, yeah. again, and, and if she said, listen, the main reason I'm here is the car, I kind of want to know that. <laughs> I, if she says, listen, you don't let me drive that car, I'm uh, out of here. That car is not mine. I'm gone. Okay, so I'm worth one half of the value of a car is what you basically yeah. say. Like, that's what I've always said. You know, look, I know I owe you. If you're in a relationship with me, I owe you things and you owe me things. I get that. Like, that's the nature of relationship. It's an economy. It's a symbiosis. But I owe you a house? Mm -hmm. what, what do we owe? How many months is it before I owe you a house? Like, no one told me the equation here. Like, whose math are we using? Mm -hmm. Because when I, this is what happens when you talk about prenups with people is they go, well, if I'm married, if we're married for more than 18 months that, you know, he, he should have to give me X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, really? What is it about 18 months? Yeah. Like, so you're saying 17 months and 29 days, he don't know you anything, but you add that one more day. Like, this is the problem with the law. You're telling me at 20 years and 363 days, you were not mature enough to drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. But two days later, you were mature enough to handle alcohol. That's stupid. You're telling me the highway, 55 miles an hour is perfectly safe, 56 is dangerous and punishable by fine or imprisonment. That's stupid. It's mm -hmm. But it's not what we have to do. We have to pick a rule and make the rule. Same thing with money. What do we owe each other? What do you want from me? What do I want from you? What do we give each other? I think that's a conversation you should have often and openly.
Yeah. Given that there is one law which seems to apply across the board, I'm curious if this matches. It, it seems to me that in the wealthiest cases, it is the richer partner who is often the man who is disadvantaged in a split. You know, I think sure. even of, Do- of Dr. Dre, who had to give up like a sure. hundred million plus, even with a Massive. prenup and was Massive. like, oh, thank God. Uh, you know, Mackenzie Bezos is one of the, if I think maybe the richest woman in the world as yep. simply for marrying Jeff. Yep. And then when I look at uh, some of the most impoverished groups of people, I see, you know, there's men who are not paying any alimony or very little alimony yep. and the mom is in charge. And it, is that understanding broadly right? Because it, it, it does seem yeah. like, you yeah, know, that is, it that screws is different the reality. People at different, yeah, that is the reality. And I think that whether it's right or wrong or what are the root causes and whether mm-hmm. it's patriarchy or whether we want to sort of red pill, manosphere, mm-hmm. MGTOW stuff. I mean, there's, I, I don't get into sort of the epistemology and ontology of that. I am more into, look, this is real. This is reality. There are a lot of women profiting off of having been married from a financial mm-hmm. standpoint. I am not suggesting that raising Jeff Bezos's kids is not something that a person should be compensated for, but hundreds of millions of dollars? Billions, I, I don't billions, know. Yeah. That seems to me, I'm gonna cut it and say even hundreds of millions <laughs> seems like too much. Yeah. You know, so, I, because there are people that do that job for much less and they do it quite well. And I don't care if you make the coolest you know, things with them and you fresh cut their meals every night, that's still an insane amount of money. Now again, I'm not suggesting that if he looked at her and said, hey, you know what? I I have the things I have because you helped me make decisions and you helped me build. And I want, I feel I owe you because you helped me build this thing. That's a different thing. But for the law to impose that because you were there at that time, I, I think that's insane. So I think a lot of men marriage is a bad bet. It's a bad bet. First of all, marriage is unlikely to work for men or women. It is unlikely. It's more likely to fail than not. And for men, the 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 if the majority of men are the breadwinner and what they bring to the marriage is financial stability, you know, um, uh, security in that sense, right? And what the woman brings is affection and caregiving and things like that. Okay, what the man is obliged to do is enforceable by law. Mm-hmm. What the w- woman is obliged to do is not enforceable by law. A court cannot yeah. order someone to be nice to you. A court cannot order someone to be loving to you. They can order them not to punch you, but they can't order them to be nice to you. That's not possible. So, but they can't order you to pay someone. So, so if you if if we have a contract and my end is enforceable at law yeah. and your end is not enforceable at law, that is not a fair contract. So mm-hmm. why would you sign why would you sign up for that if you're a man and why wouldn't you sign up for it if you're a woman mm-hmm. in that situation? Now again, are gender roles strictly that way? Absolutely not. There's lots of successful women, there's lots of complete screw up men or there's men who are stay-at-home parents and and mm-hmm. they're the, those gender roles. But look, I I'm saying the majority statistics wise, we all know that that is what it was and it still continues to be in a in a slightly uh, uh moved mm-hmm. ratio. So I I absolutely think that having, again, that conversation about why is it you want to be married to me? I don't think most people, most women would say, I'd like to be married to you so that we can sign a one-sided contract where your end is enforceable and mine is not. (laughs) So maybe they're going to say, as many people do, lots of frilly reasons. Anytime somebody tells me frilly reasons why something is good. I'm always like, you know, shut up. Like, that's not yeah. true. You know, that's not true. You know, wh- why do you work in uh, finance? Well, I just love to see people accomplish their financial dreams. <laughs> Bullshit. You love getting a commission and working in a fast paced, exciting environment. That's like me saying, I'm a divorce lawyer because I like to help children have a new dynamic between their co-parents. <laughs> like, yeah, it sounds good, but it's garbage. It's garbage. Yeah. It's not true, you know? So I think it's the same kind of thing. Talk about why, what is it you want from this marriage? What is it I want from this marriage? That's a worthy conversation for men and women to have. It's also a conversation about roles and gender roles and what are the defaults and what are the things people expect of us versus what do we really want and what will really authentically make us happy. And those are great conversations to have. As a society, they're a great conversation to have. Yeah, yes. 
the <laughs> it reminds me again uh you estimated that 99 percent of men undergoing a divorce have a sudden affliction of sits and, yes, uh, sudden income just... <laughs> deficiency syndrome. Yes, okay. I will someday, someday, because the clients always say to me when I represent a guy and he's got his own business, when he's getting divorced, he always says, like, well, there's been some changes in my business. <laughs> and someday a guy's going to go, yeah, it's doing really well. I'm going to have a heart attack. Like, that's the day I'm going to die. Because most, it's almost always, well, it's been slow. It's been slow. You yeah. know, it's really it's slowed down lately. And I'm like, well, isn't that convenient, buddy? You know? But yeah, it, it happens all the time. Because people want to protect the things they have. I think when, when the rug gets pulled out from under you and you weren't expecting, I mean, one of the hardest things is, I, breast implants is always the best example of this. Guy, I have guys who who pay for their 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 wife to get breast implants, mm -hmm. and then they're getting divorced like in a short time later, uh, coincidentally, uh, or maybe not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And and they're like, well, this I wouldn't have bought those. Like I wouldn't have spent that money. Like can I get that money back? <laughs> can I get that amortized? Like, yeah, you can't. Right, you can't. First of all, you can't get the breasts back, and you can't prevent someone else from enjoying those breasts. Sorry. But, you know, the, the truth is, is everyone, if you knew how it was going to end, you would have conducted things differently, probably. Mm -hmm. So people go, well, I would have put more in my 401k or I wouldn't have paid down the mortgage mm -hmm. if I knew she was going to get half the equity in the house. Well, courts aren't going to reverse engineer those things. But yeah. I, again, that's where I think you should be constantly thinking about, OK, if we split up, how would I feel about this choice I'm making? Mm -hmm. You know, if what were the consequences of, I mean, to tie it back to our prior thing, the beautiful woman walks by, you smell her perfume, you think to yourself, oh my God, I'd love to go talk to that girl. And you think to yourself, what if I did, and this girl was interested in me, would I want to give up the relationship I have for that little thing? And the answer is probably no. The answer mm -hmm. is no, I, I wouldn't want to trade this for that. Mm -hmm. So the more we look honestly at the choices and trades that we're making. But again, the world's done a great job of convincing us don't look yeah. at the various economies in your life. Like don't, you know, don't look at any of it. You know, they do, but, oh, you're, you're, how old are you? You're 50? Oh, you're middle-aged. Really? I'm going to live to 100? Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a myth. And you made that up so that when I'm 50, I'll continue uh, to work like a really psychopath. Hard. Yeah. So that I can keep the wheels of this thing moving, not to my benefit, but to the benefit of the machine itself. Well, you know, if we were honest with people and said, hey, you know, when you're 40, you're probably middle-aged at that point. Maybe even 35, you might be middle-aged at that point. And by the way, if we're looking at functional years where you can really enjoy yourself, 25, 30, you're getting to be middle-aged. Because wow. by the time you're 60, you're not going to, your back's going to hurt. Things are not going to work the way they always did. So gather you rosebuds while you may. We don't want to have those conversations. And love mm -hmm. is one of those things. I see, I have to tell you, I think we would all benefit from leaving the lights on. Let's just talk honestly about what we love about each other, what we expect from each other, what, what should be expected from us, um, what we're capable of, what makes us feel good, what makes us feel bad, what makes us feel loved and appreciated, what makes us feel rejected. I think if we had those conversations, we wouldn't be in the position we're in. I, I am a conflict professional. I'm a weapon that you point at someone when you want to achieve a certain outcome. And, and my job is to go in and to tell my client's story in a way that makes them the hero of the story. Mm -hmm. what, what that teaches you when you do it for 20 plus years is everyone's the hero and everyone's the villain. It's just if you catch them at the right moment. And when you realize that everyone's the hero and everyone's the villain, you realize that, you know, we all have that good and bad in us. We all have. And, and, and if we can just have honest conversations with ourselves about the parts of us that are heroic and villainous and with our partners about those same things, we can bring out the best in ourselves and each other. But, but it, it requires that really honest conversation or it requires a weapon like me to bring it into the light for you, which is yeah. not a great idea. Well, speaking of yourself as a weapon, I was, you know, blown away by some of the stories that you told in your book of what it means to be a lawyer and have a legal responsibility to represent someone who you might find to be abhorrent. And I'm yeah. I'm curious, you know, you wrote about you can perhaps even just give the story you talked about how yeah. you represented a pimp. Um yeah. and uh, you know, the other opposing lawyer was unable to get a piece of very important evidence in and therefore yeah. your guys your guy took the case um yeah. i'm curious what that feels like though because i like that to me would 
I imagine would be so gutting. You know, I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you something. I um, I learned a lot about myself writing that chapter because mm -hmm. that story happened, and I do you want to tell it? Do you want to tell it real quickly? Yeah, Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell a, a abbreviated version of mm -hmm. it. I I represented a, a guy who was a pimp. That was what he did for a living, and um. He owned a variety of businesses. He ran guns. I think he also sold drugs, but and he owned some businesses that were illegitimate businesses, but he used them to launder the cash from the from the pimping and the drugs and the guns. He's in federal prison now. He has been for quite some time um, on other things. But he uh, had had a baby with one of uh, his girls, as he called them. And um, he had uh, beaten her up terribly one night. Um, and, and when I met him, when he hired me, I actually didn't, you know, I you don't, like everyone on the first date seems really nice, you know, in the consult, everybody seems nice. He came in, he told me that this is a woman he was involved with. He had a child with her um, that he, you know, he, he basically just presented his, his own version of the story that she went crazy. She was throwing things at him. So he pushed her into the wall uh, to get away from her. Uh, and then he came home the next day and she'd stolen all of his stuff. And so I was like, yeah, I'll represent him in family court in, in what's called a family offense petition or an order of protection proceeding. And, um, you know, then it, through the process of, of litigation, I, it became obvious to me that he beat this woman on a regular basis. And, and, but my job, once I've undertaken representation as someone's counsel of record, is to be their counsel. And that's my job. It's how our system works. And I believe in democracy and I believe in our system. And I took an oath as a lawyer and I take oaths seriously. And so I was representing him. And she was poor. And so she had an assigned lawyer. And her assigned lawyer was very inexperienced and not a very good trial lawyer. There are a lot of people that are good advocates in terms of persuasive argument, but they don't know the rules of evidence. They don't know how to work in a courtroom. Um, I have, from day one, honed my skills to be a very good trial lawyer and to know the rules of evidence. And to get a photograph into evidence is very easy. You, you lay what's called a foundation. So you say, I'd like this to be marked for identification purposes of Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. And then you have it marked by the court reporter and then you hand it to the witness. You say, I'm handing you what's been marked for identification as plaintiff's exhibit one. Do you recognize this? Yes. What do you recognize it to be? It's a photograph. What is it a photograph of? Uh, it's a photograph of my car. Does that photo fairly and accurately depict your car? Yes. Your honor, I'd like to move this into evidence, please. And it goes into evidence, even if the other side objects. Because all mm -hmm. you have to ask is, does it fairly and accurately depict the thing you're trying to show? It doesn't matter who took it. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. It, does it fairly and accurately depict it? So this is something you learn, you know, trial advocacy in law school. I had a can it was a perfect storm, a cantankerous old judge who was in a bad mood that day, an inexperienced lawyer on the other side of this case, and she had a photograph of of this woman's face after my client had finished beating her senseless. And it would have absolutely destroyed my client's credibility and it would have it would have been very persuasive evidence and she could not get it into evidence she said um uh your honor um uh i'd like to put this into evidence so i did my job i said objection lack of foundation and instead of being helpful which he's allowed to do mm -hmm. the judge said yeah you have to lay a foundation counselor so she said um okay uh who who took this picture and the girl said i, I my friend took it and she goes okay and and um Describe to the court what's in it. I said, objection, Your Honor. She's asking her to refer to the contents of a document that's not in evidence. Mm -hmm. the judge said, yes, counselor, you have to lay a foundation. And he was just in a bad mood, the judge. He just wanted to like kind of break her chops a little bit. And I'm sitting there and, and in my head, I'm just thinking fairly and accurately depict. Like just does this fairly and accurately depict. Like, like this, it's like three words. Like it's all you have to say. <laughs> like it's all you have to say. And she just couldn't get it, and she just mm -hmm. sat down and said, uh, "I I don't I don't know what to do." Uh, and 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 we lost, and she lost, and we walked out, and yeah, you know, we won. So you know, I should feel good about that. And we walked out, and the guy patted me on the back, and he said, "Man," he said, "I'll never forget the sentence he said." He patted me on the back, and he said, "Man, one good lawyer is better than twenty stick up men." And we walked down the hall, and I remember thinking like. This is just, this was so bad. Like this was so, this woman was poor. Mm. Like that's, she lost cause she's poor. Like if she'd had, you get as much justice as you could afford that day, you know? And what's funny is at the time it happened, A, I was a younger man. B, I was very caught up in the competitiveness of being a good trial lawyer and opposing counsel was really nervous. And so she'd been really kind of nasty to me yeah. before the trial. 
So I was kind of like feeling good about beating her because I sort of felt like, oh, you were so arrogant and now I want to see you go down in flames, you know? But, and, and so I never really thought about it, you know? And then I wrote the book and I included that as an example of, of something about sort of the nature of what I do for a living. And when I recorded the audio book, they put you in a soundproof booth and they give you your book on an iPad and you literally have to read your entire book and they break it up, but it, eight and a half hours it takes to read this thing. So I did it mm -hmm. like two, three hour chunks over a couple of days. And I, I actually had to stop in the middle of that chapter. I, I, mm -hmm. I got very choked up and I started like, like something about reading that out loud and my mm -hmm. internal dialogue out loud was very painful for me. Like I, I hadn't really, I think, let myself feel how awful that felt um, because I felt good that I had done my job and done it well, but I felt very badly that justice wasn't served because yeah. I, I, I do believe in justice and I want to see it served. The interesting PS to that story is that lawyer, this happened maybe 15 years ago, maybe more. Um, she's still a colleague and she has become an excellent trial lawyer. And, and I have a lot of cases against her and I have a lot of cases with her. And um, when the book came out, I, I changed her to him and uh -huh. I changed all the facts of the case as much as I could. And I see her in the hallway, this is 2019. And she says to me, uh, she says, oh, I got your book. Cool. And I said, oh, that's cool. And she goes, yeah, it's great. It was the most embarrassing moment of my entire <laughs> career codified in print. And I was like, oh man, I was like, I'm sorry. I was like, I didn't mean to. She goes, no, she goes, it's good to remember. She's like, I remember that. And I remember how it felt. She's like, and I walked out of court that day and I learned evidence. Mm -hmm. She's like, because I was never gonna let that happen to me again, you know? And so it had a happy ending in the sense that, um, you know, I think that that lawyer, as painful as that woman's loss was, um, it, it motivated that lawyer to become, it made her see a blind spot she had. Yeah. And she has since helped so many people and is yeah. such a phenomenal lawyer and still does a lot of public interest work. Um, and, and we're all fortunate as a society to have lawyers like that who fight that good fight like that. So um, yeah, that that it's hard as a human being, a sensitive human. Part of what makes me good at my job is I'm very sensitive. You know, I, mm -hmm. I'm empathetic and I can read people and um, I can tell what's going to persuade them, what creates levers, you know, in a person. Um, and that part of the pain of that sensitivity is sometimes I can't stand my clients. My clients are sometimes awful people who are trying to accomplish awful things and they're lying to themselves and to me about what their real motivations are. Um, and that's hard to be around, but I, I believe in our system. You know, I believe in advocacy and I believe in due process. And I think that you know, it's like democracy. Like it's it's the absolute worst system, except for all the other ones. Yeah. You know, I think it it what's good about it is is very good. I've I've seen more justice in my career than I've seen failure of justice, mm -hmm. and so I really do still absolutely love, and I'm very proud to be a lawyer, and I think it's a very noble profession. My son uh, was sworn in as a lawyer a year ago. He's a, a, a assistant district attorney in the city. And uh, I was very, very proud to, to, and I said to him, you're, you're joining a profession, you're, you're taking an oath and you're becoming part of something that I think is a really noble thing and teaches you a lot about being human. Yeah. It sounds like the part of the system in this case that is corrupt is not necessarily due process or that lawyers have a responsibility to represent their clients to the best of their ability, but the fact that there's differential ability based on the ability to pay. And yeah. Well, <laughs> you're, if you're good at something, you're going to get paid more to do it most of mm -hmm. the time. And so the most highly qualified lawyers tend to represent people who can afford to pay them. Like when I mm -hmm. started practicing, I got $25 an hour as an assigned attorney. I get $750 an hour now. When I started, I used to take a $2,500 retainer. I take a $25,000 retainer now. Mm -hmm. So you, and I'm nowhere near, I mean, I have colleagues that are $1,500 an hour and worth it. You know, because they're phenomenal lawyers, they're experienced, they're tenacious, they're skilled. Um, and, and so, you know, what happens is when you're getting free lawyers, 
they're usually paid by public interest agencies. And yeah. again, sometimes they're phenomenal because what they are is what I hope to be at some point, which is I'll, I'll eventually walk away from private practice and and use my law degree in the public interest, you know, representing, you know, people that that can't afford it and creating better access to justice. I think all good lawyers have an obligation to like cultivate their careers and then give back cool. in terms of public interest. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's an unfortunate reality of anything. I mean, look, it, everyone deserves to have a really good doctor, but you know, the best doctors usually are expensive to go see, you know, mm -hmm. to have concierge medical service is expensive. So, you know, that is the way that capitalism works. And, and I, I don't think there's a better alternative to that necessarily. So. Got it. Got it. Uh, switching switching up gears, there's a handful of, this is one of the three stories that I wanted to touch on. Um, the second one was the Ocho, which is not necessarily a story, yeah. but it's, it's just a little bit of uh, yeah, legal, yeah. legal jargon that I was yeah, wondering if you yeah. could unpack. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so child support is done by percentages and, and um, one child is 17% uh, of your gross income, less FICA, which is Social Security and Medicare tax, and two children is 25%. And three children is uh, uh, 29% and four children is 31%. And when when people are married and have a child, you know, if you look at the statistics, like married with a child and the child is getting close to school age is actually like where a lot of people get divorced because mm -hmm. the honeymoon is over. The, the glow of the kid is sort of to losing its luster. Um, people are reaching their mid 30s, late 30s, early 40s, which is already a time where you start kind of going, I'm not as young as I used to be. So a lot of people throw the Hail Mary pass of let's have another kid. Like that'll bring us together. That'll add some excitement. It'll give us a pleasant distraction from the fact that we're not really as into each other as we used to be. It'll give us a shared sense of purpose again. But really, we jokingly say all it does is adds 8% to your child support because you went from <laughs> 17 to 25%. So when someone has a second child <clears throat> and they divorce within like a year or so, will behind the scenes refer to that kid as the Ocho because he's just eight, he's 8% 8 more child support. That's all you got. You thought you were going to save the marriage and all you got was the Ocho. You got 8% more child support. It's not to yeah. say they don't love the kid. It's not to say they regret having the kid, but you thought you were going to save your marriage and all you got was was the Ocho. You got 8% more. Yeah. And and that's an unfortunate reality with people. I think it it, you know, it would be good if people realized that, you know, that is not a real solution to that problem. Having another kid is not the, you know, I love the fact that people, I have people who come in all the time, you know, substance abuse is a tremendous, a tremendous impetus for divorce and for, for problems in marriages and, you know, alcohol abuse and all kinds of other substance use disorders. Oh, there was a period of time where the opiate crisis really was affecting marriages in a tremendous way. And uh, probably still is in many ways, although it's, it's tampered down from what I can say a little bit. Um, but, but we, we say all the time that, you know, when you talk to someone and they say, oh yeah, when we were dating, he drank way too much. And, you know, when we were engaged, yeah, he drank way too much. And you kind of go, and invariably yeah. they say, but I thought once we got married, he would settle down. What? Re why? Like, what about yeah. that? Like, this is the previews to the film, guys. Like, mm -hmm. the preview is the best parts of the movie. Like if the preview sucks, the movie's going to suck. Yeah. Like, trust me, like the preview is them going through and finding the coolest parts to show you and get you excited about the movie. Like if your girlfriend's treating you like shit when she's your girlfriend and hardly sleeping with you when she's your girlfriend, she's not going to sleep with you more when you're married. Mm -hmm. You know, she talks down to you around people or she, she belittles you to her friends when you're dating. It is not going to get better when you get married. Like a person drinks too much or they flirt with other women or they sleep around on you and cheat on you while you're dating. They're not, oh no, once we're married, there'll be this magic that'll sort of come over us that now we'll be really invested in the relationship and we'll be, it's ridiculous. That is mm -hmm. absolutely, it's not even a prayer. Like a prayer even has a chance. That's just stupidity. Yeah. And, 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 but people do it all the time. They think that this is going to change something. And the Ocho is a great example of that. They have a kid. You know, yeah. Yeah. Have a kid. Let's have another kid. And we'll, maybe we'll remember how we felt when we had that first kid. Maybe we'll magically be those yeah. people again. That's, that's like saying, you know what? If I put on my wedding dress, I'll feel like a newlywed again. You know, you, yeah. you won't. 
it's funny how many drastic actions people will take before they sit down and have a hard conversation. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. they will bring another oh. life into this world. They will Absolutely. commit themselves legally to someone. They will go cheat. Like anything to avoid speaking right. plainly, openly, and honestly to the person with whom you are supposed to be closest. Be because it's incredible. we are so, but I think it goes back to that original question you asked at the start of this conversation, which is why hospice work? Mm -hmm. Why those? I, I really believe we run from pain and mm -hmm. discomfort in the most irrational ways and in ways that sabotage. You know, I, I, I remember reading an interview with Joe Rogan some time ago where he talked about the insanity of his workouts. Like he does like ridiculous Taekwondo workouts and then he yeah. does like saunas and ice plunges and stuff. And he said, he's like, the first two hours of my day is so nightmarish that everything seems easy after that, mm -hmm. you know? And I adopted that to my own life. Like I, I, I do rigorous exercise in the morning. I do ice plunges I have for many years and I do it because I really feel like when you start your day with that, you know, that intensity and that discomfort, you really approach everything much more realistically when you're when you're not running from discomfort. I, I mm -hmm. think that that in relationships, you you need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You need to be okay. When my sons were young, I remember my son was like 14, my older son. And he came downstairs, he was dating his first quote unquote girlfriend. It was like the first little lady, like held hands on the playground or something. It wasn't like a real relationship. <laughs> so he might've been even younger, he might've been like 12. And he came downstairs and he said, um, and he seemed upset. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, well, he said, we, we got in an argument. And I said, oh, what, what'd you get an argument about? And he said, well, I, you know, I wanted to play World of Warcraft with Chris. And I told, you know, Jane that, and um, she got upset because she like thought that, you know, like maybe we would hang out today. And I said to him, you know, let me give you a piece of advice, son. I said, learn how to disappoint a woman. <laughs> like learn, learn how to dis I don't mean that to say like screw women's feelings. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that. Learn how to disappoint her a little bit, but, but being honest to yourself yeah. and to her, because if you don't, you will eventually disappoint her giant amounts. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll build resentments against her. You'll you'll change who you are, the person who she liked so much. Like it is really important to learn how to disappoint your partner in a loving, respectful way, and to be able to do that. I'm not saying enjoy it. Uh, you you shouldn't enjoy the pain of another person, but you certainly should accept that sometimes, yeah, you're not gonna be able to meet their exact need exactly when they want it. Nor should you expect them to meet all your needs the moment you want them met. Mm -hmm. It should always be a dance. It should always be you know, a balance and a harmony of some kind. And the only way to do that is by learning how to be candid with your partner about disappointing them, where you've been disappointed and, and finding, having those tougher conversations. I, I think we are capable of doing that and I think if we did it more often, we'd get better and better at it. And we would feel genuinely more loved and more loving. I really, really believe that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, it, it just is making me think that so much of like, what is the problem people are trying to solve when they're married is this, this deep, yeah. deep existential, I don't know how to feel good <laughs> by myself. Yeah. Let me add yeah. things to me. Let me add yeah. a job or a career or a wife yeah. or a kid. And it's that yeah. I need to look outside of myself. And what you told your son on that day is like, don't lose World of Warcraft. <laughs> you know what I mean? right. like, like fine, maintain right. the capacity to, to make the choices independently to do the things that you need yeah. in order to fulfill your life rather than transforming into what will make her pleased with you in the moment, yeah. which will eventually create a rift in. Yeah, and find and find the vocabulary. Like find the vocabulary to show her that your love of World of Warcraft and spending time with your friend Chris is not a betrayal of your love for her. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's not a, a test of which do you love more. Uh -huh. It's not it's not that at all. Like what is what is her objection? What why does she what does she feel? Does she feel like you like Chris more than her? Well, maybe you can point to well, wait a minute. I spent 
five days with you and I'm going to spend one with Chris. So obviously I enjoy time with you. Mm -hmm. Is she having a rough day today? And she says, look, today's just a really bad day. And today, okay, then how about today I'm with you and tomorrow I'm going to tell Chris we're going to play World of Warcraft. Yeah, yeah. Like, like if we could just talk honestly about what we're feeling and why we're feeling it, we would all be richer for it. Like she would be too, because yeah. she can understand that. Yeah, it's not World of Warcraft and it's not Chris, but you can say, hey, wait a minute. Remember last week when your friend got that, you know, new thing and you went over to her house and you hung out with her? Well, I would have loved to have seen you that day, but mm -hmm. I understood how excited you were to go to your friend's house and to do that thing with her. So I left it be and I, of course, but I always love to be with you. And if a man could be two places at one time, one of me would always be with you. <laughs> but the truth is, you know, I got to figure out, I got an iPhone battery that's this big and, and how much of it goes down each day. And I got to figure out who gets what percentage. And today, yeah. Chris and World of Warcraft, they're going to get 5%. <laughs> You know, and so I think if if you had those conversations, not only is that conflict resolved, but it's teed up for the next one. Mm -hmm. And also look at what you come back to that with. Like I know my staff jokes with me because on mornings where I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I don't have to tell them, they know. Cause I come in and I'm calm as a Hindu cow, you know? <laughs> and, and on days where I don't, I come in and I'm all wound up and stressed. And they're always yeah. like, well, he didn't train today, you know? Yeah. Like, and they can smell it on me. Yeah. Like the person who comes back, the woman who comes back from yoga class, I mm -hmm. like better than the one who left to go to yoga class. Yeah. The yeah. gym who comes back from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you trust me, you want to date that guy way more than the guy who left to go to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That guy's mm -hmm. more chill. He's more relaxed. He feels good. He feels invigorated. He's more attentive. He's paying more attention. He feels like he's got a life outside this relationship. So he comes back to the relationship feeling energized and excited. He doesn't feel like a simp uh, who's not you know, <laughs> giving up his life and, and just what do you want to do today, baby? Whatever yeah. that is, that's what I want to do. Like, And by the way, that's who she fell in love with. She fell in love with a guy who had interests other than her because he didn't even know her. You know, when you met, she didn't, your girlfriend six years ago didn't know you. You know, yeah. or 10 years ago, she didn't know you. You know, now she does. And and and, and does she now want to turn you into something other than the person who you were that she fell in love with? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, oh my God, I love this person. I can't wait for them to be completely different. What? That makes no sense. Yeah. Yet And yet people try. You know, they. I think they see the, they are drawn to those interesting things about, oh my God, look at these stories and he does jujitsu yeah. and he's got all this stuff, but I'm threatened by the parts of his life that he loves outside of me. So let me start to, right. or, you know, it can go reverse with the But you just hit on that perfectly, which mm -hmm. is I'm threatened by those things. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the thing we've got to look at because I get that. I'm not judging someone for that. Like I, we all have insecurities. We all want to be special and important to our partner. And so we all know what it's like to feel like, oh, does this person prefer that to me? Or, oh, I, I right now in this moment would really like to do this thing with this person. And they're saying my needs aren't important to them. It's very scary to have mm -hmm. needs. Like it's mm -hmm. some men suck at it. I know it took me like my entire thirties and forties to be able to have the emotional vocabulary to say I had needs yeah. because I always wanted to be the kind of guy that was like, I don't need anything. I don't need yep. anything. I don't need anybody to do anything for me. I can do my own laundry. I can do my own cooking. <laughs> I don't need a goddamn thing from anybody, you know? And I like to be a man of will and I like to be, but I, I have to tell you something. I, I really don't think that, that every man for himself should be the underlying ethos of our lives. Like I, mm -hmm. I think we are all better for our connections, you know? And so being honest with ourselves and with our partner about, hey, these are my needs, you know? What are your needs? And how do we reconcile those so that we both can maximize the meeting of our needs in this relationship? Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having that conversation. I think that that's the most loving thing you can do is to, is to really talk honestly, first with yourself, which is the hardest part, to identify what you really yeah. want and need. Because sometimes it's not pretty what you want. Like sometimes mm -hmm. it forces you to make choices that are scary. You know, that I've outgrown this dynamic or this this job no longer has the luster for me that it did. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I realize I decided to do this thing because I thought it was going to make me feel a certain way and it hasn't made me feel that way. So do I just keep, like I made a wrong turn. So should I just keep driving? Like mm -hmm. that's the stupidest thing in the world. If you realize you made a wrong turn, you're not gonna be like, well, I'll just keep going. 
I'm yeah. not going to turn around. You know, that would be admitting defeat. Okay, so you're going to end up in Utah? Like, what are you doing? Like, you made a wrong turn. Like, stop. Retrace your steps. Figure out where you made the wrong turn. And then go the other way. Or, or mm -hmm. give up the trip entirely or something. But don't just keep going. You know, and yeah. that that's what happens in relationships. Is it's like, I'm miserable. I can't stand them. But, you know, I put in eight years. So I'm we're getting married. Wait, mm. why? Why? It, we're not happy. We don't really like each other. But you know what? I, I'm not, I can't get those eight years. It's like the stock. You know, I bought the stock and it's going down and down and down. But damn it, you know, I'm, I'm holding that stock. Why? <laughs> you made a bad bet. Just let go. Learn to let go and to use whatever capital you've got left to buy some other stock, hopefully. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that's how it works. I think I think that the point that underlies that what you were saying is that the people are not even aware of their own needs and they're often only able to express it in a way as I want you not to play World of Warcraft. What that little girl, <laughs> you know, what she was needing, you know, at the time yes. was to I need in my life to feel chosen, special, right. seen. And it actually, I can live with you playing World of Warcraft today. I can well, live with you playing it all the time. hundred percent, right. If it was little... we can negotiate to me to get my core need met, and if I can express it and talk, you, Amen. I have space for World of Warcraft. But if I can't state my need, and all now we're arguing about World of Warcraft, and you have a need to have things outside, but now we're never but going it's not to find about, a way. It's not about the World of Warcraft. It's not about mm -hmm. the pasta, right? It is mm -hmm. about... It is about the underlying need. It is mm -hmm. about the what that girl was saying to him in 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 again, forgivable when you're 12. Mm -hmm. But when you're 30, mm -hmm. like you should be able to say, well, you know, because here's the thing. If he just spent the day with her, it's not like that need would have been met necessarily, mm -hmm. right? Because just being together is no guarantee of you feeling loved or special or seen yeah. or any of those things. So what is it that she wanted? She wanted to feel special. So maybe that's as simple as saying something like, you know, I'm I'm going to do this thing with Chris, but I'm going to miss you the whole time I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I, I really want to do this with him, um, but I can't wait to see you tomorrow. Yeah. And I'm so excited for that. Or even just the jump that I made of, listen, if a man could be two places at one time, mm -hmm. one of me would always be with you. Mm -hmm. I, I have said that in my relationship because I, 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 I'm always working. I love my job. But, but if a man could be two places at one time, like, yeah, of course. Like one of me would always be with a beautiful woman who I love, you know, like mm -hmm. that's an amazing thing. But the truth is we all have a higher purpose, a higher calling. We all have things that we want to pursue. And by the way, our romantic partners want to see us succeed and they want to see us you know, be the fullness of ourselves or at least they should want to. Like I, I want my romantic partner at the end of their life to say, that person helped me become the most authentic version of myself. Mm. I can think of no greater compliment than that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, if my children someday say, my father helped me become the most fulfilled, authentic version of myself, man, drop the mic. That is the best thing you could ever ask for. And and so if that, if that should be the goal of a relationship, mm. it not, well, I don't want to be lonely. Get a dog. You won't be lonely, you know, <laughs> or, or live in a city where there's lots of places to hang out with lots of people. You won't be lonely. You know, figure fi what you really want is someone who sees your blind spots, who appreciates you, who makes you the best version of yourself possible and mm -hmm. who you can see and feel that you're doing the same for them. You're helping them be the best version of themselves possible. That that to me is should be everyone's goal in a relationship, because again, every relationship will end. The minute you love someone, you are starting to lose them. Just like the minute you're born, you start dying. You know, so the clock is ticking. The minute you're in a relationship, the clock is ticking until that relationship ends. And you hope it will end in one of you dying. Mm. I mean, it's the weirdest thing in the world, but it's the truth. You're, you hope your relationship will end when one of you dies, you know, but you will die. That relationship will end. So what mm -hmm. will you do? It all starts the same. We're fascinated with each other and we're the, this is the most amazing person in the world. And it all ends the same. They die. Each mm -hmm. person dies. So it's the middle that matters. Like the story is what happens in the middle. And that's what we have to work on. And, and, and we have to, if we have one eye constantly on the destination, we have one with which to see the way, but I think we'll see the way much more clearly if we mm. remember the destination. Beautiful.
There's uh, there's one final question that I had, and I think it's a great place to wrap on the uh, marriage relationships. I do want to ask, because having the Charisma on Command channel, you're an incredibly persuasive storyteller. Like you said, you seem to know the type of story for the particular situation to mm. move a person. Is that something that you just unconsciously absorbed from your environment, or did you put any sort of conscious effort towards that suite of skills? That's a, a great question, and I've never been asked it. Um... So I think I was always very sensitive. Mm -hmm. I was always very sensitive, and I, 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 and it was a terrible burden when I was young because mm -hmm. I was, I was a dork. You know, I was like a geeky little kid with serial killer glasses, and I was real chubby, and I wasn't that great in school, um, and I wasn't good at any sports, and um, but I was real sensitive and real intuitive. And my sister, who's six years older than me, I didn't have a lot of friends, so I didn't have a lot of people to hang out with. So I would hang out with my sister and her friends, and I would just sort of sit there and kind of observe. And, and as a result of that, I ended up hanging out with women, lots mm. and lots of women, my sister and all of her friends. And women, at least at that time, I think the world has changed, thankfully. But back then, like men, you could either be Richard Simmons or Clint Eastwood. Those were like your two choices. <laughs> like you didn't, there's nothing in between. Yeah. Um, And so I just remember like, I didn't really know how men were supposed to behave. I, I, I hung around with my sister and her friends and I, they just talked, women talked all the time and men didn't like men didn't talk much. Like they would, you know, like, oh, what do you want to eat or what sport yeah. are you into? But they didn't talk about their feelings. They didn't. And I didn't realize that because whoever discovered water, it wasn't a fish. Like this was just what I was in. Yeah. And when I got to college, um, I was broke, you know, I didn't come from money. And so when I would ask a girl out, I would say like, oh, do you want to go to the diner? And we could just like sit and talk. And women loved that. Mm -hmm. Like, you just want to sit and talk? And, yeah, like I just want to talk. Like, I don't know, we just talk about the, I don't know, our issue, feelings, issues, politics, life, like whatever, stories. And I just learned that this was the way to you know, to connect with women, you know, and, and, and it was really, I mean, I think, you know, young men, most things you do, you do to try to get laid. And so for me, that was it. Like I, I thought, well, you know what I can, I can, I'm a good storyteller and I'm interested and I'm interesting. Um, and that was enough for me. And then, um, I got very intrigued by the idea of debate because I, I loved disagreement. Like I, I just found conflict is the most interesting clay. Like you can build, you know, commonality through it and you can build understanding through it if you approach it the right way. And so I got very interested in debate and, and I, I was raised very religious. I was raised in a very Catholic home. And uh, then I, like most young people, went off to college and decided I'd go the complete opposite direction and be like a rampant atheist. But I was a rampant atheist who'd read the Bible like, thoroughly like three mm -hmm. or four different translations of it wow so i would go to the inter i would go to the intervarsity christian fellowship meetings and they would have speakers and i would argue with their speakers mm -hmm. i would i would quote scripture to them and i would like refute <laughs> and to their credit most of them were really open to that like they were like intrigued that they were like wow like because people of faith are very interesting because they were like wow god sent you here to test my faith like god sent you here yeah. to like challenge me and and for me to try to persuade you and i loved that i thought that was like the coolest thing that you know the idea of like okay like we're gonna we're gonna fundamentally disagree with respect for each other and we're just gonna go at each other and let the see which idea comes out, which is the last idea standing. And um, I just learned that to me, that was the most exciting, enthralling way to build connection and rapport with people was to either the act of the communication, the storytelling, or debate. Like mm -hmm. conflict is a wonderful opportunity. Like it's yeah. such a heightened state for people. Like when you get in an argument with someone or you have like a, I, I had this interesting experience today. I was driving in the city, I was driving in Manhattan and this guy like pulled out in front of me and he was like driving really slow and I just got like annoyed and I honked at him. Like kind of like, come on, man, what are you doing? Yeah. And we pull up to a light and like he pulls up right next to me and I pull up and I'm like, you're not gonna mean mug me, buddy. And I look <laughs> over at him like this, like and I'm gonna hold his gaze, you know? <laughs> and he looks over at me and he's gonna hold my gaze. And we both just looked at each other for a second and then we both went, 
like this. <laughs> and he laughed and I laughed. And I just looked at him. I went like this. And he went like this. And I thought... <laughs> That was awesome. Like, that was awesome. Like that felt so good. I felt so close to that guy because yeah. you know what? We're not mad at each other. Yeah. Like we're mad at the fact we're in traffic in the city and we're mad at the fact that the Lincoln tunnel was closed and we're trying yeah. to figure out how to like, you know, we were man enough without a word to like get out that annoyance and yeah. then kind of give each other like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then the mm. sort of like, no, oh, dude, what are we doing? Like, like yeah. come on, you know? And, and we bonded in that. And that's why I love Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because, you know, I've been like, I went to Barcelona. I don't speak a word of Spanish. And I went to a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school there. And I, I couldn't, no one spoke English, but we all knew how to choke each other and try to strangle each other and break each other's limbs. Mm -hmm. And so we trained and like, man, when we finished each round, like we'd hug each other, pat it. I, these people were now my friends. Yeah. We couldn't say a word to each other, you know, but there was this exchange of, like conflict and resolution that just feels so, I don't know, it just feels, I love the connection of that. Like I love the connection that, that can be born of conflict yeah. and respectful conflict where I want to be understood and I want to understand you and persuade you. And I, I, mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I, I never had any formal training in it. Um, I think it's one of those things. It's all about reps. I think yeah. you just have to challenge yourself to have conversations. Things are uncomfortable until you get comfortable with them. And the only way to get comfortable with talking is to talk. And yeah. the only way to get comfortable with, with conflict is to have safe. That's exactly what I was hearing was safe containers for conflict repeatedly yeah. over and over and over. Yeah. I, uh, I also argued with everybody about religion and, yeah. <laughs> and that but what a beautiful <laughs> cool thing to argue about because yeah. there's nothing more important than what, what happens, you know, and, and no one can claim to be right. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you can claim to be right, but no one, we're not going to find out. Like you're not going to yeah. find out until it's too late to come back and tell me. So I think it's a really beautiful invitation to talk about, well, why is that important to you? Or why do you believe that? Or if that wasn't true, what would you change about your life? You know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think those are really worthwhile questions to ask somebody. But I think in the relationship context, you know, I said this recently in another interview that that we learn how to fight while we're in a fight most of the time. And that's a really mm -hmm. bad time to learn how to fight. Yeah. Like if if you love someone and you're going to have regular interaction with them, you're going to disagree with them at some point. You're going to have some conflict in your relationship at some point. So why not have a conversation about how do you fight and mm -hmm. what, what feels like I personally, I don't fight dirty. Like I like rules, mm -hmm. you know? So if I'm in a relationship, whether it's a romantic one or a friendship, if you've shared with me intimacies about what you're afraid of or what your worst fear is or, or things that make you feel very embarrassed, and when I'm mad at you, I weaponize that. Mm -hmm. That is the cruelest, most unforgivable sort of a thing to do. Like I would never do that to a person. Mm -hmm. Like if you're in a relationship with a woman, you know like four sentences you could say that would just turn her into a pile of jello in the corner crying. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if you have a relationship that's worth anything, that she knows your soft targets. <laughs> like she yeah. knows the couple of things she could say to you that would just eviscerate you. And I'd love to believe if you love someone that there's nothing they could do that you would you would deploy that that nuclear missile, that you just wouldn't do it. You wouldn't weaponize that intimacy. Mm. And so to me, having a conversation with someone about how they fight and how they disagree without being cruel tells you a lot about their character. It really yeah. does, you know? It's it's becoming clear to me, I think of some of the shyer people that I know and even of myself, that the opportunity to have those conflicts in a way that does not break love is one of the building blocks of what you might yeah. call a charismatic personality or it's, yeah. it's the ability to safely break rapport and like you did with the guy in the car and then re-enter rapport because there are right. people that could right. not well have because there are people that in sitting in your driver's seat could not have laughed in that moment because no. they don't know how to go up and come back and that right. they would that, escalate and escalate yes. and escalate and and or 
they would back down completely from yes, that conflict yes. and they'll pull back and not even want to interact. And then they're carrying around the fear or they're carrying mm -hmm. around the anger at themselves for their fear or whatever. And there's so, it's such an invitation, right? Like it's such an invitation. And this is why I, I am very much of the mind that argument can be the thing that will save us as a culture. Mm -hmm. Like we need to argue better. Like we need to argue more and better because yes. arguments become a dirty word. Like it's become, well, this is my echo chamber and this is your echo chamber and everybody in that box sucks and everybody in that box sucks. And that's all we're gonna do. And we're getting nowhere. Whereas if we get to the core of like, what is it you're upset about? What is it you're feeling? Where do we disagree? I don't care where we agree. Yeah, we agree on lots of things. We all like puppies and rainbows. Okay, that's not interesting. You know, that's not interesting. Yes, you, oh, I love my children. Who doesn't love their children unless there's something wrong with you? <laughs> you know, like, oh, I like ice cream. It's fucking ice cream. Of course you like ice cream. Like, what What I want to know is, what do you dislike? What is it that upsets you? What is it that you are afraid of? Because that's where we really can start to, like, find real connection with ourself and with someone else. It also challenges me. Like that was a challenge to that guy and a challenge to me when we pulled up next to each other. Because mm -hmm. am I going to be man enough to laugh at myself? Am I going to be man enough to look this guy in the eye and then be the first one to kind of blink? Yeah. You know, because I just went with my heart, which yeah. is I'm staring at him and he's staring at me. And I realized, what are we going to do? We're not going to like get out of the car <laughs> and hit each other. And I just kind of laughed. And then yeah. he was man enough to kind of laugh too. Like it kind of be like, what is, what are we so upset about? You know, yeah. and I feel like I don't know that guy, you know, and I don't know where he is right now, but I like shared a moment with that guy. Yeah, and I yeah. hope he's having a great day. I got to tell you, I hope he went <laughs> home and said to his wife or his <laughs> husband or his kid, like, oh, I had this funny thing where this guy and I pulled up and it was like, we gave it to And I, I really, that's a beautiful moment that happened mm -hmm. between that random person and I. And you know what, I wanna believe in some fairy tale world. I wanna believe that he went home in a better mood because of that interaction. And maybe he was a little nicer to someone and that person was a little nicer to someone in this butterfly effect, ripple effect. <laughs> like that. This, this can be how we save the world. Like yeah. these lofty aspirations of we're gonna make this giant systemic change and the other side, we just have to get rid of all the villains on the other side. Like it's never got us anywhere. It's never going to get us anywhere. I, I think we have to roll our sleeves up and figure each other out as people. And the only way to do that is by fearlessly going into the places where we're not exactly the same and figure out what we're supposed to mean to each other. Yeah. And I, I just will reiterate you because of your experiences with jujitsu, with arguing, you are capable of entering that place without a panic that locks you into ever escalating right. amount. It can I can go yeah. in and then go, I'm I'm comfortable enough here to just go. <laughs> what, yeah. what which well, is which I used is amazing. To laugh. I used to laugh when I used to go to those university Christian fellowship meetings because I would be talking to this person and they would say, well, I disagree. And I'd say, well, my beliefs don't require that you believe them. Mm -hmm. Like, that's okay. That's the difference between our respective beliefs is my mm -hmm. belief, though. I don't require you to believe my beliefs. Like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I believe them anyway. Like I have a defined sense of who I am, Yeah. but I open up to the possibility that who I am should be malleable in some way and that it's open to change. And I don't have pride of authorship of, of that. I know everything. I know I can't know everything about myself, learn everything about myself from myself. I know I need other people to help me know myself better and see my blind spots. And so I, I genuinely believe that, yeah, the first thing in jujitsu, the first few months of training jujitsu, all you're trying to do is overcome the insane adrenaline response that happens when someone is on top of you <laughs> trying to attack you. Yeah. And so the beginning of jujitsu is just learning to stay calm and to someone's trying to choke you and you're just going to breathe and protect yourself and figure mm -hmm. out the next position. And, and that is, once you get that, that's like one of the hardest things, but the mm -hmm. only way to do it is by doing it. The yeah. only way to, like, you don't learn to swim by reading books about swimming. You learn how to swim by being in the pool. And it's the same thing. You learn how to argue better by arguing. You learn how to find commonality by being with people who you don't have a lot in common with. Mm -hmm. Like we find peace by walking into the conflict 
fearlessly, with love in our hearts, with knowledge of self and with openness to this other person and and just being able to fearlessly, you know, turn that clay of conflict into something. And I think, like I said, I think we all could be better at it. And I think charisma, connection, again, understanding and being understood, you know, being fascinated and being fascinating, that's the key to this. And and yeah. so that's why I, there's nothing more worthy for people to study, in my opinion, than how to communicate with others and, and how to express who they are to themselves and to others. Amazing. Where uh, do you have a place where you would like to direct people uh, to to go see? I know that you've got a number of interviews that that soft white underbelly took off, and you'll probably yeah, be on YouTube quite a bit. Yeah, that went quite crazy. <laughs> yeah, that went crazy. Yeah, I I have a um I have a a, a, a podcast that I, I I've been doing for a couple of months now on uh, LA Magazine, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is called um, Not Too Late, um, and you can find it on YouTube, and you can find it on uh, on on uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, that is basically a conversation about legal types of issues, and I mostly yeah. talk about the law. Um, I'm in the process right now of putting together a, a you know a, a podcast and a program um, about conflict and about argument and about what as a trial lawyer and and what I call full contact storyteller, um, what we can learn about ourselves from conflict and and how we can enter into conflict more comfortably uh, verbally. And um, yeah, I mean, mostly I, I, I'm i just out here practicing law and, and living life. And, uh, um, you know, you can find me on Instagram at NYC Divorce Lawyer, although I don't post very often. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and mostly, like I said, my book is out there. You can get it on Amazon or you can get it on Audible uh, and listen to me drone for eight and a half hours. Um, but I appreciate you and I appreciate your, uh, your all of your content. I have to tell you, I enjoy it very much because I think um, it's wonderful to see, particularly, I think, for men, conversations about conversation, you know, conversations <laughs> about connection. Yeah. And and it's not a skill. We're, we learn it on the job and, and it's not something everybody's born with. And I think it is something you can get better at is how to connect to other people and how to be charismatic, how to be someone who um, communicates confidently. I think that's mm -hmm. a really... I, your style of communication is a very confident style of communication. And, and I, I think that um, no one is just born with that. You develop that skill. Uh, and I, so I think you have a lot to share with people. So I, I've always actually encouraged my sons to, to, to consume your content. So That's awesome. I will continue to do so. So thank you. I will tell you there, uh, if you have interest, there's a lot of space for you on YouTube. I think you could Thanks. crush in a number Thanks. of different avenues. Yeah. If you, uh, I yeah, see lawyers it's, it's... covering court cases that you could talk about. There are, I yeah. think you could smash with your own channel. Yeah. You know, I'm very blessed that there's a lot of things that I think I, I could do a good job at and monetize and and um mm -hmm. i i very much love my job i love being a trial lawyer and when i'm not doing that job i i really love reading and working out and i i, I live in a, a in i have a, a place in the city and then i have a place in the middle of the woods uh <laughs> and i i like to spend a lot of time in the middle of the woods uh, yeah. in the quiet so i um i don't have any aspirations of i think fame is a mask that eats into the wearer Yep. And uh, I, when my book came out, I was very happy, but I was not really that interested. And I, I, I very much appreciated the generation that felt that fame was an unpleasant side effect of talent, mm -hmm. and not something to be pursued. Um, and so I've represented celebrities and I've represented people who are very successful and famous. And, and, and people who aspire to fame, in my experience, um, have a lot of insecurity. Yeah. They're really interested in the praise of strangers. Um, and and I, although I, I appreciate every message I get, every of the 15,000 comments on that YouTube video of the millions of views, I, I appreciate all of those positive things. But I, I don't, my beliefs don't require someone to believe them. I, I'm very comfortable with who I am and, and, and the message, you know, that, that I send and the messages I try to receive. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. We'll see. I, I never expected the things I said in that interview to catch on the way that they did. I don't always know what I have to say, what's interesting and what isn't. Um, my ex-wife once jokingly <laughs> said to me, I said something to her and I said, you know, well, what 
you know, I told you that. And she goes, you talk so much, it's hard to see what's important. <laughs> and I was like, that's a fair point. So um, I never know what's important and I never know what's gonna be compelling to anybody, but I'm, I'm always grateful when, when anybody is interested in hearing what I have to say. And I'm humbled yeah. by that, so. Awesome. Well, Jim, thank Thanks you so much. Thanks for having me. What awesome. a pleasure. Absolutely. Pleasure. Great stuff. Keep making the great stuff you make. I appreciate it.